right, if you have a Bible this morning, turn to two places in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and uh, Jeremiah chapter 35. 1 Samuel chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 35. All right, now I'm going to bring you a message this morning on two kinds of fathers. And this will be a Father's Day message. You ladies will get some relief. And you know, every time you preach a message like I preach about God and woman, some woman always stops you at the door and says, when are you going to get on the men? <laughs> and so we're going to get on the men this morning. I'm going to bring you a message on two kinds of fathers, Jeremiah chapter 35 and 1 Samuel chapter 2. Jeremiah 35. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now I'm going to read the passage from Jeremiah 35, and then I'll make reference back to Samuel when we go a little bit further. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 35, I'm going to begin uh, at verse 8. And here the sons of Jonadab, uh, uh, Rechab, they're speaking to Jeremiah, and they say this. Jeremiah 35, 8. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he hath charged us, to drink no wine all our days, we our wives, our sons, and our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in, neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed. But we have dwelt in tents, and have obeyed, and done according to all that Jonadab our father commanded us. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon came up into the land, that we said, Come, let us go to Jerusalem, for fear of the army of the Chaldeans, and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed, for unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you hearken not unto me. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them, and you shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and your fathers, but you have not inclined your ear, nor hearken to me. Because the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people hath not hearkened to me, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken to them, but they have not heard, and I have called to them, but they have not answered. And Jeremiah said of the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you, therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. Father, bless the reading of your word, and may the lessons that are found therein be clear to us, clear to this congregation. We ask in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Now, I've read you here a story about a father who meant business, and I'm going to compare him with another kind of a father back in 1 Samuel chapter 2. So if you'll take 1 Samuel chapter 2 in one hand, we'll look at it first, and talk about one kind of a father, then we'll come back to Jeremiah and see about another. Now, this is Father's Day, and there isn't a father here that, uh, that has, well, you've got to be a father to have children and children have a father. It, would, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't seem like you have to say that, but, you know, some people are fathers without children. I never have understood it. But, they, but I mean, no common sense would tell you you have to have children to be a father. Uh, some folks don't have any common sense. Well, anyway, now, if you have children, you're a father. <laughs> there are two kinds of fathers that you can be in the Bible. There are probably more, and I'm going to take extremes. I'm going to take one of the worst, one of the best, and going to talk about them. And uh, you women can sit in this one and listen. I like the story about the doctor who examined a man, and he said to the man's wife, frankly, I don't like the way your husband looks at all. And she said, I don't either, but he's nice to the kids. <laughs> and a father should be nice to the kid, but he should be some kind of an example. And you've heard the story about the man that was climbing in the mountains, and he heard footsteps behind him, and after a while he heard this little voice behind him saying, Father, look out for the safe way because I'm following. And one of the great responsibilities of being a father is you always have some young boy looking at you and coming along behind you in your footsteps and you wear your shoes. And I suppose the same true of mothers and daughters. You, it isn't a little girl ever lived, didn't slip in the mama's shoes. They're much too big to fit her. And an old poem says this. It says, 
I know a man, he lives nearby in the land called everywhere. You might not think he's a man by his hat or the clothes he may choose to wear. But beneath his jacket with many a patch lies a heart more precious than gold. The heart of a man neath the coat of a boy, a man who is 12 years old. For we never can tell what the future may make of the boys that we carelessly meet. For many a congressman is doing the chores and presidents play in the street. The hand that is busy with playthings now, the reins of power will hold. So I take off my hat and I proudly salute the man that is 12 years old. So there are men in the making that are boys, and boys follow the daddies. They love the mamas, but they usually follow the daddies. All right, now this first man. Back there in 1 Samuel chapter 2, the first thing I want to have you know about this father was he spoiled his boys. Verse 29, the Lord speaking to Eli about this matter of his sons, and he said, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded my habitation, and honor your sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. And there he's saying, plainly that Eli spoiled his boys and gave them the best things, and despised God's work and honored his boys above God. And when a father spoiled his boys, he's going to give them a heartache. And I imagine all fathers really love the boys do on occasion. Uh, I know I have mine. I know I have mine. There, well, there are things around the house, around the yard I do all the time. I probably ought to get them to do. And you wouldn't believe why I do it. I do it because I enjoy work. That sounds like a fool statement for a man to make. I mean, to me, I get a blessing out of getting a hoe and a handle and a rake and an axe and a shovel and just going out and sweating. But my boys aren't too fond of that. <laughs> I was just there, just lack of maturity or what. But uh, we have a whole generation like that. You know what I'm going to laugh at? I'm going to laugh at when some of you teenage kids get grown up and have your children. I want to hear you tell them what you did without. <laughs> now, that's the truth, brother. Won't that be a howl? I mean, you, some of you punks, go up and tell your children, when I was your age, I didn't have, what didn't you have? <laughs> you had a suit, you had a tie, you had a car, you had money, what do you mean what you didn't have? You had an air-conditioned bedroom, a television, a radio, a transistor, a cassette, a pair of earphones, a BB gun, and a twenty-two, and a shotgun and a pistol. What did you get along without? That'll be interesting, won't it? Daddy said one time, he said, when I was a boy, we didn't think anything of a 10-hour day work. And the boy said, I don't think much of it myself. <laughs> boy said, I want to be old enough to do what I please. And the father said, I don't know of anybody that ever lived that long. Did you hear what I said? I never met anybody that lived long enough to do what they please all the time. You're going to have a long growing up period, bud. You'll hit 100, you'll still find it has problems. This man spoiled his boys, didn't make him work. Maybe didn't make him attend the temple, I don't know. Their daddies like that. Their daddies that don't put any discipline in the boys, they've heard them say, well, my daddy made me go to church all the time since I was a boy, that's why I don't care anything about it. Now, you're a liar. You know what you are? You're a cheap, spoiled, rotten punk, what you are. And you can quote me, I said it just the way I meant it, and that's the way I said it. You had a daddy that was good enough to try to get you in the church and get you under the Word of God to see to it that you went went with you. You had a good daddy, and he, he'd make a better man dead than you would live. Or these folks down south, well, it's me be gone all the time when I was a boy, and I just don't care about going anymore. Well, I saw a rascal like you wouldn't have cared about going if I hadn't made you go. Spoil them. All right, chapter 3, verse 13. More. Chapter 3, 13. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. He didn't punish them. Didn't get on them. A man said one time, he said, there are too many strapless dresses, too many strapless bras, too many strapless swimsuits to evoke O's and R's, too many strapless woodsheds, too many strapless fads, too many strapless offsprings who strap too many dads. A lot of truth in that. Not wrong whipping that child when it's growing up. I don't know what it is. Maybe he left it to the woman. Maybe he just talked and said, the woman, you whip me. Last time I whipped one of my boys, I told him, I said, oh, Ted, I'll give you a choice. I'll give you a choice of ten smacks with this belt, or you can't go over to a neighborhood house and watch television for four weeks. <laughs> you know what he took? Why, well, sure you know what he took. You bet your life. Folks, I don't see what's wrong with that. Just like dope. Just like dope. I'd like to see you give me my choice in that thing. <laughs> I know what to choose. He just talked, <laughs> left him alone, didn't get on him. 
I heard Fred Brown say one time when he grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, he said the, the, there was a peach tree out in the backyard and they never got any peaches off that tree. His mother, I think, had eight boys. And all that peach tree was used for was switches. You got to punish them. And I'll tell you, when a boy gets to be about even two, or at the latest three, it's time occasionally to get out of something and whip him and hit him. I mean, corporal punishment. I know what they say. You got these announcements. Don't beat the little darling. Well, they got announcements now in the hour. Public service announcement. Cruel to the parents. Parents mistreat their children. Oh, yeah, it may happen among a certain class of people in certain ethnic groups. Yes, that's very true. But I don't see any sense in messing up a whole country just because one or two folks can't behave. I mean, I don't believe any of you folks tie your kids to a bedpost and burn them with cigarettes. <laughs> I don't think you do. <laughs> Although some of them probably need it. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, one time two boys were coming home from Sunday school, one about 10 years old, one about 12, and a kid about 12 said, what do you think about all this devil business? And the kid about 10 said, just seriously, he said, well, he said, I think it's going to kind of turn out like that Santa Claus business. I think it's going to turn out to be daddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 2.12. First Samuel 2.12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Well, this man didn't lead him to Christ, that is the expression goes. They didn't know the Lord. In the Old Testament, he didn't lead him to God. In the New Testament, he didn't lead him to Christ. I guess he didn't think it was very important. Didn't get it done early enough. If it isn't done early, it isn't going to be done late. Now, I know some of you got off to a bad start. A lot of us got off to a bad start in life. A lot of folks will never understand a lot of us because they know nothing about it to start with. But I'll tell you, if you've got a little old boy girl, three or four or five or six years old, you better make some plans to get them to God and get them to Christ. And it better hadn't be said of them when they grew up that the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. That ought to be important to you. And, of course, after they get grown, then it's too late. I was down there in Fort Walton one time talking with a man, and he was sitting there with a can of beer and smoking a cigarette. And I tried every way in the world to get that fellow to receive Christ. He wouldn't do it. And he had a boy there about six years old playing around the backyard in his bare feet. And I said to the man, I said, well, if you wouldn't get saved for any other reason. I said, what about that boy right there? I said, that boy gets older, he's going to do just like you're doing with a beer and the cigarettes. And he said, well, when he gets old enough to make it his own mind, I'll let him make it his own mind. No, he won't. That boy will make up his mind long before he gets old enough to make it up. You know they're doing that to some of you kids in high school. You kids get in junior high school and high school and that teacher is trying to teach you to be a mature, responsible adult who can't pay his bills. <laughs> a mature, responsible adult, you see, who doesn't pay attention to what mom and daddy say or the preacher says, make up your own mind. Well, let me tell you something. You put that stuff on people, the old nature being what it is, they've already made up their mind. A little bit late after get to be up there around 16, 17, and 18. A bunch of teenage kids in the family got together and they said, let's give Daddy a real birthday present this birthday. Let's, let's let him use his own car. <laughs> you get that kind of thing. That kind of stuff goes on all the time. It must be done early. Verse 17, he allowed these young men to hinder God's work. Verse Samuel 2, 17, wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. He allowed them to hinder these boys had no respect for the congregation of the Lord, and old Eli was too worn out to care. So he just let them go. Well, I want to check out the t spiritual temperature of the congregation sometimes, see how things are going. I'm not sure the kids are actually around, oh, 14, 15, 16, 17, along in there. And I find things aren't right. I know somebody's been working on them. And somebody's been, some scorner has been at work. The old book says, cast out the scorner and strife shall cease. Yea, pride and contention shall go out. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. Only by pride. Somebody thinks of something more than they are. Where you have that, you have trouble. All the time. I watch these teenage kids all about that age, and I find that kind of thing going. I know I'm dealing with a mom and daddy doesn't care. They don't care about the testimony. Words mean nothing. You don't care about the ministry. Words mean nothing. You can tell it. He let him hinder. Didn't call him aside. He said, look at here, kid. When they give the invitation, bow your head and close your eyes. Look at here, kid, when they're singing, hold your hymn book and sing. And look at here, kid, when they're singing, don't be messing around and passing stuff around and putting spitballs on the stuff. If he cared about the testimony, he said something about it. But there are people that don't. Just turn them loose. Let them go. Let them... You know, I guess that's why we sometimes you suffer a shortage of kids about that age. Maybe get along in there someplace. 
get too hard to handle. I notice all these worldly churches have a lot of them. A strange thing, isn't it? Let them hinder the work. I've seen invitations where folks got up and saying, yes, I am without one, plead but that thy blood was shed for me, and the kids sitting there punching other and laughing, joking, fooling around. Well, what, what's, what, what, what's the deal anyway? You leave in hell, you get saved from hell? Well, if you got saved from hell, how come you don't have enough respect for a lost man or woman under the preaching of the gospel to try to get him out of hell and get him into heaven? I've had unsaved people tell me they've been in Baptist churches and stood back there behind an invitation watch that kind of stuff go on and just made up their mind or nothing to it to start with or nothing to it to finish. Men come along, jump their women off the church go to Sunday school. You don't care about your family. Men come along, jump their wife off, jump the kids off. I'll pick you up after Sunday school. Too late, brother. It's too late. You pick them up after Sunday school. You want to have your wife be a good Christian woman? Why, you come with her and sit with her. You want to have your children grow up and fear God and believe the book? Then you come with them and you sit with them. And Eli didn't. He wasn't a good father along these lines. He spoiled them. He didn't punish them. He didn't leave them the right way. And he allowed them to hinder God's work, which never should be done. All right, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35. Thank heaven we have a different kind of a father. Now, this is an extreme. You have them all ways between. You have the ideal, and then you have the wipeout. And this man here is an ideal father. You wouldn't find one man like him in a thousand, but two thousand, maybe. Their little eyes upon you, and they're watching night and day. Their little ears are quickly taking every word you say. Their little hands all eager to do everything you do. And little boy who's dreaming of the day, he'll be like you. You're the little fellow's idol. You're the wisest of the wise. You know, boy thinks his daddy is so... I mean, you ask any kid in this town who's the greatest man in the town, he'll say his daddy. I'm a little old squirt, hadn't got any sense. <laughs> his daddy may weigh, 300, may weigh 300 pounds, not be able to lift a paper sack, hadn't done a day's work in 15 years, but you couldn't convince the boy. You're the little fellow's idol, you're the wisest of the wise, and his little mind about you, no suspicions ever rise. He believes in you devotedly, holds out all you say and do, he will say and do in your way when he's grown up just like you. There's a wise little-eyed fellow who believes you're always right. His ears are always open. He watches day and night. You're setting an example every day in all you do for the little boy who's waiting to grow up to be like you. One time a Sunday school teacher heard a little boy in class say, I'm never going to read the Bible anymore. She said, why not? He said, because my father doesn't think I ought to waste my time reading the Bible. And she said, did your father tell you you shouldn't waste your time reading the Bible? And he said, well, no, said, but he don't read it any. You know, they're quick to th see things like that. A boy or a girl, they know what turns you on, what turns you off. They know what you get excited about, what you want to get. You don't fool them. You don't fool them. Listen, you sit in front of that television and that thing comes on, they see your face all that up in that eager anticipation, just can't wait to get to it. And then a little bit later, a bunch of folks going out on the street to have a street meeting. They don't see you in a hurry to get there. They know it. They know it. Let me tell you, when somebody gets saved, somebody says, well, we have 35 saved in Native Vacation Bible School, 24 saved in Native Vacation Bible School. They see your face. They hear your response. You go by and say, well, good. Uh -huh. Well, good. And the night you sit in front of that boob tube and watch uh, Miss Alabama or Miss Georgia get crowned Miss America or Miss Globe or Universe and, oh, she got it. She did, huh? You know something? They're quick to pick that up. They see the example. All right, verse 6. First thing about this man, verse 6, this man commanded respect. And sometimes you have to command it. You can't always get it, just asking for it. All right, verse 6, but they said, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall drink no wine, neither you nor your sons forever. Well, the old man meant what he said. And he said, If it's going to be this way or else, then that's the way it was. And if he says, no wine, no wine. They said, no this, no this African music, then none of this African music. And folks say, well, they won't like you. That's true. Say, well, they'll hate you. That's true sometimes, temporarily. And they'll call you hypocrite and find fault with you. If you say it, back it up. Back it up. Say, that's the way it's going to be. That's it. There's going to be none of this around the house. There's going to be none of that around the house. The old man commanded respect. Meant what he said. Separated. You know, the old-timers word was as good as a bond. Back in the old days, the fellow said, I'll pay you $500 on the first day of the month. You had the $500, you had his hide. He came ready to get handcuffed and go to work for you if he didn't bring the money with him. But not anymore. 
All right? Verse 14, this father inspired confidence. Verse 14, the words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his son not to drink wine, are performed, for unto this day they drink none but obey their father's commandment. Verse 18, because you obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts, therefore, so forth, and so on. He inspired confidence, which means he set the example. If he told them no wine, then no wine. No wine. If he told them no magazines, then no magazines. If he told him none of this, then none of that. He didn't come around and say, all right, now, don't have one of these, and then had one himself. Set the example. They'd seen him pray. They'd seen him read the Bible. They'd seen him serve the Lord. He prayed with his wife. She was living. You boys, girls here, seen mom and daddy pray together? You seen praying together? And if a man says to his boys, you ought to pray, they ought to see him praying. Your daddies have a place loan your house someplace, or a place out in the yard someplace where you go to pray? You boys ever seen you there? You ever tell them to get off alone with God and pray? If you do, do you, do you do it? See? He inspired confidence. He set the example. And as I said before, you know children are quick to spot formalism. They're quick to spot it. A child can spot right away when a thing is just A, B, C, D, and when the heart's in it. They're great children are great mimics. They're great actors. I've always loved them. I like little kids. I think they're great. I mean, you kids about two, three, four, five, six years old, I think of nothing like them. And they always, they always want the, you know, the real thing. And, and if they see a real thing, they'll, they'll counterfeit it. Boy, you see those kids run around the country, those pistols, you know, and cowboy hats on and boots on. They know all the things. I've seen them draw the same way to do it. I mean, really. And hold it the same way and get the same look on the face when they did it. I mean, just bore right down the line. This father here set the example. He inspired confidence. And he got obedience. Verse 8. Verse 8. Thus we've obeyed, obeyed, obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab. He got obedience. Well, that's because love was mixed with it. They knew the daddy loved them. Do your boy know he loves you? I mean, you can't just command them. You just can't just say, that's the way it's going to be, or else, and then leave it there. They got to know you love them. Did they know you love them? This daddy here commanded respect and he got obedience because his command was backed up with some law, too. Now, some of you may not have had too much. You know, I had a very peculiar father. He's dead and gone now, but he was, he was Prussian. He was blonde haired and blue eyed and hawk nosed. And if him and Bismarck stood side by side, I doubt you could tell them much apart. And you know, he was a militarist. And you know, militarists are the most cold, unfeeling people in the world. I mean, they really are. They could just, you know, up, hook, hit, pull, right flank, left flank, forward, march, back, hook, hit, hook, hook, you know. I, I knew an SS man, former SS man, and, and I saw him one time trying to help his wife out when she was sick. She'd been, I mean, 104 fever, flu, double pneumonia, and, and he came into the door where she was, lying, been lying in bed, I guess. She'd been in bed about three weeks. And he came and stood in the door and he said, uh, I put her on <laughs> Now, what woman wants to be talked to that way? Apple or orange. And I remember the first time I was off to a citizen military training camp, and I was a young man. I hadn't seen my father for about two months. And that was the longest then that I'd ever had not seen him. And he was a commanding officer of the camp, full colonel then. And I was just, you know, book private down there in one of those company streets. And I hadn't seen him for about two months, and he showed up at the camp and came down the company street. You know, I didn't have any sense. And I went out there and said, hi, Dad, you know. And he said, catch up. <laughs> boy, hey, man. And I mean, I mean, right through the manual arms, boy, I mean, the inspection, everything else, you, that's a one-man inspection right there in the street. And after about 10 minutes, he said, at ease. I <laughs> oh, <laughs> You know, sure, Dad. <laughs> I relaxed, you know. And uh, he said, uh, how you doing, boy? Oh, that's as warm as it ever got, man. <laughs> I have to worry about running the temperature there. When I got to be about 18 years old, I thought about running away from home. And I don't guess I hardly ever lived a boy that was a real boy. I didn't think about that once in a time. And I, a bunch of fellas got together, and they got down at a drugstore, and they said, we're going to meet you down there at uh, 10 o'clock tonight, and, and we'll all be ready to go if you'll show us where to go. I was going to show them, man. I mean, I know how to get down to Orleans, and get in the boats down there and ship off South America. We're all packed and ready to go. And somehow or another, the news got back to my father about it. And he called me in, 
from the back end of the bedroom so he won't talk to me. And he stood me up there and talked to me, and I just was well, a damn it, you know, just blank, no response at all. And he, I was about 18 then, so he's pretty well, he's pretty well grown. And I didn't say much to him, and finally he said, uh, are you going to go? I said, uh, yeah, I'm going to go. And he said, uh, Pete, he said, what would you think, he said, of a commander? He said that knew he was going into a battle and didn't have to go into battle. And I said, if he had to go into battle, that's something else. But I said, if he didn't have to, and he's going to take his troops in, knew it was certain death for all of them. And there was no compulsion or no compunction upon him to do it, and he didn't have to do it, but he had his free choice about it. No pressure. He said, what would you think of a man that go ahead and do it anyway? That hurt. That hurt. I just dropped my head and didn't say anything. And he said, Pete, he said, you know something? He said, I think you're going to go ahead and do it. But he said, I tell you, I believe. He said, I believe the only reason you want to do it is just to prove that you don't care what I say. That hurt. And I turned around and left the room. And about an hour later, I went on down to the drugstore where those fellows were waiting. About four of them. They're all packed up, man. They have the suitcases and little old bags wrapped on sticks. Back in those days, you take a stick and put a band band in the end of it, you know, and put your junk in it. We were real bums back in those days. <laughs> and I, I came down there and I said, we're not going. Oh, Ruckman. Oh, oh, you know, boy, I sure, I, boy, my stock went down quick. It went down quick. Oh, why are we going? I went through the thing. We never went. We never went. We never went. I, I, I wasn't particularly taught to love my father, I guess, like you should, or him love me, but I'll tell you one thing. He used to give orders. We used to obey him. We used to obey him. He wasn't even a saved man. He got obedient. All right, verse 10, verse 10, but we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. Well, he raised spiritual children. Now, I know these children were spiritual children because it says in verse 9, he told us not to build houses, nor to have vineyard, nor plant gardens, but we dwell in tents. You know what those people were? Those people were sojourners, pilgrims, strangers, sojourners. He raised those kind of children. He didn't raise worldly children. Children came up to him, knew this world wasn't a home. They knew the home was in heaven. They were only down here for a short time. They knew they might leave any minute. He kept that thing before them, death before them. And said, you're not here to get your roots in. You're not here to settle in. You're here to sojourn, travel up and down. And he got those kind of children. That's a good father. I wonder what kind of father you are. I wonder what kind of father you're going to be. Some of the great experts on fathers have never been fathers. It's like some of the great experts on motherhood have never been mothers. There are a lot of, we got experts that are more spurts than ex. <laughs> Years go up there in the in the woods of Alaska, a man was going along through a very cold night and got into a storm, and he knew he'd die if he didn't get help, and he came to a cabin up there in the woods and looked inside it. It was a very rough place. Every place he looked there, he saw a gun. There were guns hanging around the wall and guns by the fireplace and guns by the bed. He looked in there and saw a skinny old country woman, looked just harder than nails, and saw a bunch of little boys and girls all looked too big for their age, and all of them rough and dirty looking. He saw a man in there, looked like the son of Frankenstein, and he was afraid to stay outside and perish, knocked on that door and came in there and sat down, and they told him he could stay there overnight. They looked at him kind of funny, and he began to get shaking the boots. And he said to himself, what have I walked into here? He had a great sum of money on him he'd been carrying in his boot, and he figured these people here probably kill me and take everything I got. And that even wore on long about 8 o'clock at night. That fella got up, walked over to him, about 6 feet 2, about 225 pounds, and bent over there and said, Stranger, he thought his hand had come. <laughs> he said, In this house, he said, We're pretty rough folks. And he said, We're pretty plain folks. And he said, uh, We have some habits a lot of folks don't understand. So we work real hard. He said, I trap for a living. All I do is hunt for a living. That's the only living we got. And he said, so every night before we go to bed, he said, we all meet here and have a little prayer and read something out of the Bible. And he said, if you're like mine, you can join us, and if you ain't like mine, you can step outside and wait till we get through and then come back in. <laughs> Went on about his business. And that fellow saw something. He saw he's safer there with a rough man than he would have been with some smoother folks. And he saw something else. The word heathen, so they changed it to Gentile, kind of softened things up. The New American Standard Version doesn't have any heathen in it. 
The New American Standard Version and other dead orthodox publications published by apostates say Gentile instead of heathen. But the word heathen is a good old word. 25, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, The Lord reigneth, which he'll do when he comes again. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice, and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. Nature is waiting to be released. It has been released. Nature is under a curse. The fields and the trees don't break into singing and rejoicing till the Lord that made them comes back. And when he comes back, they'll cut loose like nothing you've ever seen. 34, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And say ye, save us, a prayer of Israel. Save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen. There's that word again. From the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and, be, and glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Father, bless the reading of your word here this morning and give us a glimpse of what you see here today. I know as your eyes look down upon this country and upon this world, you don't see what Borman and Lovell and Carpenter and these fellows saw when they took their picture. You see something else. And we want to see what you see this morning. We want to look at the way you look at it. We want to look through your eyes of compassion and pity. We want to have the understanding you have and the, and the love that you have for fallen men as we preach this morning. We pray this morning every Christian this building will get a worldwide vision, not just a, a town vision or a country vision, but maybe see things like you see them and know them to be. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Now I'm going to talk this morning about the chains of the heathen. This word is used by the Lord Jesus Christ and it's found in the Old Testament 150 times. These new Bibles always try to slick things over and smooth things down. I have no confidence in them because I know slick, smooth people, and slick, smooth people, you can't have, not, you can't have confidence in them. Any man will take that word blood out and put that word death in instead. Any man will take that word heathen out and put Gentile instead. Any man will take out that word hell and put in Hades instead is not to be trusted as far as you kick this villain with your left foot. That's the work of a man that's trying to cover up the truth. Those words are too clear. Hell, blood, heathen. So that's man's talk. And when I find a bunch of suicide men sitting around at a translating table and changing those words, I know what kind of men they are. I know how they think and how they operate. They're not to be trusted. This word is heathen. Now, what about the heathen? One time a missionary said to me, he said, I've been in five foreign countries preaching the gospel. And he said, the heathen all have the same marks. I said, how are they marked? He said, you can always tell the heathen by a certain number of ways. He said, number one, they like to run around half-dressed. He said, number two, they like to paint their bodies. He said, number three, they're all religious. And he said, number four, they all like wild dancers. I don't know whether he was describing West Pensacola College or University of Florida, what he was describing, you know. I didn't, I don't know what he was describing. But he was talking about the heathen. Now, I want to say three things about the heathen. They're sick physically, they're sick socially, they're sick spiritually. And when I say the word heathen, I'm referring to the masses of sprawling mankind across this globe that God looks down upon the night and sees and knows these things to be true about. Case number one. A missionary writes that babies are born perfectly healthy when they're born in many parts of Africa and they contract leprosy by being breastfed from the mother who has leprosy. And if you simply take that baby and get that baby in a bottle instead of on a breastfed mother who has leprosy, the babies wouldn't have leprosy. They're born healthy and then they grow up as lepers. They're sick physically. Case number two. A missionary said there are vicious sores all over the people I work with. He said, I've seen sores so infected the bone is gone. And he said, many times I've worked with a sore where there were live maggots in the sore that hadn't been removed. Now, nobody even fool them with water or anything, even dressed in the womb. They're sick physically. Christian Weiss, a missionary, said he's taken a jackknife and Lysol and put it on infected fingernails where a baby has had a little boy, one or two or three years old, has had an infected fingernail that got so infected the whole hand swelled up. 
and by simply taking a knife and cutting the thing open, putting a little antiseptic on it, made the thing well. Next case, babies were born blind in many heathen lands from sores around their eyes, and soap could have stopped it. Soap could have stopped it. These babies come in, and they're born healthy with eyesight, and they go blind the first year, and a mother with a wash rag there and some soap and water could take care of that baby's eyes where it wouldn't be blind. The heathen are sick physically. They're sick. They're not just sick spiritually. They're sick physically. They don't know how to take care of themselves. And when God looks down this earth tonight, he doesn't see a great big mass of well-dressed people in collars and suits and shoes and ties and nice automobiles and food. He sees masses of people that are blind and sick and infected and dying and no way to get well. The Lord sees those things. Brethren, I charge you, I hold you accountable. I hold myself accountable. God's going to hold us accountable if we go on living in Pensacola like there was nobody in the world but just us, the way some of these Christian people in Pensacola do. Boy, if you think it's all here, you haven't got very big eyesight, you better get them enlarged and spread out. There are many Christians get so involved in their own work, they think that's the only work in the world. There are many Christians get so involved in their own church or their own school, they think that's the only church or school in the world. There are many of these conceited, egotistical, demon-possessed, saved people in this country who are Christian leaders and celebrities, and their vision doesn't go beyond the front yard. And God isn't interested. God so loved the world, brother. God so loved the world. He sees the dead babies and the blind babies and the leprous babies. Next case. A Christian missionary told me he saw a dance one night where everybody got all hopped up on liquor like they do in America and got danced around the fire, and a baby was uh, fell in that fire during the dancing. One of the mothers that was dancing dumped the baby in the fire, and he said that baby screamed with vocal cords. He gave out on it, and finally it was dead. And the mother cried the next day when she found out what happened to the baby. That goes on in America all the time, brother. The heathen are not all in Africa. You can find folks in Cleveland and Chicago and New York that live just like that and die just like that, too. Just like that. The heathen. They're sick, physically. The VD rate in American colleges would indicate that perhaps some of our college folks are infested with the heathenism. A fellow told me 30% of the people take the physical examination for the draft, flunk it. They're sick physically. They're sick physically. 30%, man. 30% that go in there can't pass the draft examination. Sick, man. Sick. Sick physically. Young men, 18, 19, 20 years old. The stomachs are sharp, their heads are sharp, their ears are sharp, their eyes are sharp, their teeth are sharp, their mouth is sharp. They're, they're sick. You know why? They're heathen. They're heathen. Heathenism will make you sick physically. Number two, the heathen are sick socially. And when I say social, I refer to the great mass of people out there that you look at tonight. And maybe you've never seen them. But the Lord sees them, and he knows they're sick socially. Why, in Asia and Africa and India, women are beasts of burden. Even the old American Indian let the woman do all the work. He'd uh, hunt and fish and fight, and the woman did the rest. The reason why some of you women don't leave this building here today after you finish with this uh, Sunday school and church with a 100-pound load to your shoulder or a 50-pound load in your head is because you're in a country that's comparatively civilized. You're not, you're not heathen, at least not like these people are. In many countries in Africa, men take five wives, ten years apart. A fellow marries one at 20, another one at 30, another one at 40, another one at 50, right on down the line. If you're treated like that in this country, you'd have a fifth. And the only reason you can't be treated like that in this country is because you've got law courts and lawyers and judges. And the reason why you still have some semblance of law and order in this country, some semblance, I didn't say law and order, some semblance of law and order in this country is because this book is still preaching taught in certain places. But place where this book is not preaching taught, the women are nothing more than animals, beasts of burden. Their place in Africa where girls are bought for wives when they're 10 years old. 10 years old. That kid's 10 years old, some fella up in his 40s or 50s, buys her for a wife. They're sick. They're sick. Folks say, we have no business interfering with those folks. What's going to do? Just let them die and perish and go to hell that way? Ruin their mothers and ruin their fathers and ruin their daughters and ruin generation after generation? <laughs> folks say, all oh, back there in the days of British imperialism, American, Britain mistreated those people. We own this and that. We own. Listen, the folks that got out of there and came over here were the luckiest people in the world. There are people over this country right now that have TVs and air conditioning, central air conditioning, and drive cars around and have open face Mitchell spinning reels. There are people here that have deep freezers chock full of food that if they'd been left where they were and some missionary and somebody hadn't gone back there and taken them and given the word and gotten the word to them, they wouldn't have anything but a bamboo hut in a tree, brother. I have no sympathy at all this modern philosophy of history that makes everybody a criminal that went over there and tried to help the heathen out. 
or educate them or transport them where they could get educated. I don't believe any of it. I don't believe any of it. Why, as many of the heathen people that came to America, if you offered them $20,000 to go back to the heathen land they came from, they wouldn't go back for $20,000 in cash. They got better sense than some folks in America do, some of these imperialists. The heathen are sick socially. They're sick socially. Did you know the heart of Africa tonight? There are hundreds of tribes, not one or two, but hundreds, where the boys are taken out in the woods when they're 13 years old, and they're taught every vile practice you can think of, and some you can't think of. And the men in the tribe take them out there and teach them, and train them in it, train them in it. They've got a problem. They've got a problem. The heathen are sick socially. Next case. A man told me that among the tribes where he worked and ministered as a doctor, he said the children came in this world with ruptured navels, some of them half as big as their heads when they were born. I know the missionary told me one time he saw a little boy going to a barber shop, and the barber began to shave his head, and the boy had scabs all over his head. And what they did, two big grown men held that kid, 12-year-old kid, down that chair, and that fella shaved him, and the kid screamed through the whole thing with blood running off his head, running down his face, running all over his shoulders, and those two grown men sat there laughing. You know why they were laughing? They're sick. They're sick. The heathen are sick socially. Nobody with any social grace at all, any touch of humanism, nobody with any regard for human life or human feelings would think about laughing or thing like that. But modern hippies do. Modern hippies do. They found a couple there out west a little while ago. A fellow had parts of a dismembered hand in his pocket. They've been eating people. You say, who? Americans? Californians? Big joke. Why, Charles Mann, some of his bunch, when they killed, they laughed about it. You know what's wrong with those folks? They're heathen. They're heathen. That's what's wrong with them. And the heathen are sick socially. They're sick socially. One time I had to talk with some radio announcers down here in town, and they were asking me what I thought about this street preaching. I was asking them one, I forget which. And we were talking around and round about that thing, and they said, well, a lot of our people don't approve of it. They said, there's no need to preach out there in the street. There's a church in every corner in Pensacola. I don't mean anything. I don't mean anything. Jezebel had 400 prophets to preach to her, brother. You never found a man in this world, Sir Rodney, he couldn't get a preacher to please him. You can always find one somewhere. Fellas, so the church every corner of this town, what does that mean? I don't mean anything, man. This town is filled with heathen. If you don't think Pensacola is filled with heathen, you ought to go downtown Saturday afternoon like we do and stand up there and preach. You talk about heathen, man. I've seen travelogues from Africa that couldn't come anywhere near it. I mean, couldn't come anywhere near it, man. You see every kind of costume you can think of down there. Lots you can think of. And we're talking about this man, and he said, well, uh, he said they preached in the street back in Paul's day. Now, so they had heathen back in Paul's day. He said, well, they had them back then, but they don't have them now. I said, no, man, back in Paul's day when he preached in the street, they were worshiping the great goddess Diana, the image that came down from heaven. They called her the queen of heaven, and they had statues of her in their temples. And one announcer wasn't too well read and said, we don't have that anymore. And the other announcer blushed. Uh, look out there. You know, down there in Texas, one time a missionary was going into a certain home, and down in southwest Texas, you have a lot of those homes. And he went in this home here, and he started to deal with this lady, and she said, I'm of a different faith than you are. He said, well, I knew that. I took that for granted. And she said, but you notice there are no saints around here? Of course, she meant statues, you know, but she said there's no saints. And he looked around the room, and it was surprised there were no saints in there. And you all know that happened. There a bunch of chickens over here in this third floor eating, but no saints in there. And he said, well, what happened to the saint? She said, well, I had a saint. She said, he was standing right over there. And she said, one day I prayed to him and claimed a promise for him to help me. And uh, I was told he would help me. And she said, I prayed to him. He didn't help me a bit. And she said, I waited for two years. He didn't help me a bit. So I got disgusted with him, she said. And I just let him sit over there in the corner. And she said, one day one of the chickens jumped up on top of him and knocked him down and he broke. And she said, I made up my mind, if that thing don't have enough power to keep a chicken from breaking enough, it can't help me a bit. So I haven't got any saints, you know, and out they went. So she's kind of converted heathen. <laughs> but you know, sometimes the heathen are smarter than you think they are. Did you know after World War I, there was a British colonel in Africa talking with some men back there, and he was talking with a cannibal chief, and the weirdest conversation you ever heard. He said, that cannibal chief, he said, we've just had a great war in Europe. We've had more than four million casualties. And the cannibal, through the interpreter, said, well, what do you mean, four million men killed? And the cannibal said, how did they taste? And the colonel said, why, you, you know, you don't shoot bull, old boy, you know, we didn't eat them. And the cannibal was astounded. And he said, well, what'd you kill them for then? <laughs> I mean, you know, a real sure enough cannibal wouldn't kill a guy he wasn't going to eat. Just like a good hunter isn't going to kill something he isn't going to eat. 
good fisherman isn't going to catch something and take it home if he isn't going to eat it. And that cannibal couldn't imagine how much people kill two million people not eat them. Just the sound of them. He thought they were heathen. Maybe they were. Maybe they were. Why, listen, you go downtown Saturday and you can see the heathen. They walk by there and they're too rude to take a track and they're too incoherent to talk. Some of those smart people are so stupid that they can't even carry on a conversation with you and they're too proud to take a track and they go by there and turn that thing down just like a cannibal. Take it and turn it down over in the middle of Africa. Or the way a red Chinese would turn it down in the middle of Shanghai. We got heathen in Pensacola. The heathen are lost. They're lost spiritually. They're lost spiritually. Turn to Romans chapter 1, and let me show you the charge. They're dead and trespass in sin. They're lost. They're lost. They're going to hell. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And when the Lord looks down, he sees all this and knows about all this. Romans chapter 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this cause God gave them up under vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even if they did not like to attain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with blam, 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 blam. They're lost. They're lost. They're lost. They're lost. They're naked. They're painted. They dance. They're religious. A man told me in the place where he worked in Nigeria, 80% of the babies die. 80% of them die after they're born. One man wrote down there's no nursing in the place where he worked till the child is six days old. One man said in the place where he worked, where a medicine man was, when a baby got sick, the medicine man gave him medicine, and the medicine was composed of stuff you couldn't even mention. 60% of the people took it died. In one tribe in Africa, human twins are ground in mortar with grain by the mother and then stomped into the ground. If twins are born, they're put into a trough with a grain and then a pestle, a pounder is taken there and they're pounded into that grain, mashed in that grain, and then planted in the ground and dirt over the top and they have the tribal dance over the top of it. Our Christian vice says that human sacrifice is definitely on the increase in Africa, and I hear from Vietnam that uh, human sacrifice is definitely on the increase in Vietnam. These the heathen. They're lost spiritually. You see, we get too comfortable. I get too comfortable. You get where it's just me and mine. And it's this little place right here. Now, we support 19 missionaries. Got them up there on the walls. And I'd like to see 19 more down here, and then 19 more down here, and then 19 more across there, and then another 19 across the top. And folks say, you get kind of fanatical on that thing, kind of hung up on it. Yes, I believe so. But I don't believe you can get too hung up on that thing because I think God's interested in these people. And I think God loves these people. I think God loves them just as much as he loves me. And I think God is just as much interested in the welfare as he is in mine. I have a chart out there at the school. It's a big circle. And that big circle, Americans make up 6% of that big circle. 6%. And that 6% that make up that big circle eat over half the food that's in this world. And the other 94% get the other half. And if I read my Bible right, God is not going to bless anybody really spiritually unless they get concerned about somebody beside themselves and are out there. You say, what about these people right here? We've got people right here that have it tough, I know that. We have people right here that need to be witnessed to, I know that. But listen, these people that are right here have welfare. They have the Salvation Army. They have rescue missions. They have the government. They have relief. They have pensions. They have insurance. That bunch over there, there are millions, listen, there are millions of them that have nothing. 
I don't know whether you know it or not, but 85% of the people in this world go to bed hungry at night. Nobody in Pensacola has to go to bed hungry at night. You don't have to go to bed hungry. You don't have to. I bet I can get you some food right now, right this minute. You say, well, sure, well, that's what I'm talking about. I bet anybody in this town could get some food if they wanted to get it. They could get it. But there are places in Africa, isn't in China where they can't get it. There are places in Asia where they can't get it. You might not be able to get a steak, but you can get a McDonald's. <laughs> Hamburger or something. Pretty bad, almost as bad as eating dirt, but not quite as bad. <laughs> All right. Did you know over there in India, you have people you have people in India that are burning their uh, widows with the husband? Somebody said, that went out with the British government. No, it didn't. I had a missionary tell me the place in India where when the man dies, the widow's still burn for them. I had a man tell me that the Ganges River, they still drown babies occasionally. And goes on and on again. Folks say they're against imperialism, they're against America and England, and these wasps go over here and try and tell these folks what to do. Now, while we have a we have a bunch of folks in America today going around teaching that the wasps are to blame for everything, the white Anglo Saxon Protestants. And they owe people this, and they owe people that, and they owe people this, and they owe people that. Let me tell you something, if it hadn't been for old Queen Victoria in England, if it hadn't been for this old English Bible, there are millions in India and China that'd be in hell right now that are in heaven instead. And the reason why many people in India and China can read today is because some fella came out from Scotland or England and went over there and taught them how to read. And if they read Engels and Marx after that, that's their business. But Engels and Marx didn't teach them how to read. Why, the greatest missionary in they ever had was a man named Alexander Duff. And Alexander Duff lived back in 1860 and 1870. When Alexander Duff got to be up in his 80s, he came back to England. And he made an appeal before the Presbyterian Church for missionaries to go to India. And when he got halfway through his appeal, he had a heart attack. And he fell over and they carried him out there in the back room and laid him down there. When he came to, he said, where am I? They said, you were in the middle of a missionary appeal. We had to take you off the pulpit. You're sick. And he said, I haven't finished my appeal. They said, you can't finish your appeal. And he said, I've got to finish my appeal. Let me go back in. And they said, you go back in taking your own hand and your, li your life in your hands, you may die. And he went back in. And he stood up in that pulpit again, and before that group of young men, older men, he said, when Queen Victoria calls for soldiers to go to the colors and fight in India, hundreds respond. Doesn't Scotland have anybody to give for the lost of India? There's no response. And he said, doesn't this Scotland have any more fathers and mothers that will give their sons to India? And there was no response. And the old man said, very well then. He said, I'm an old man. And he said, I'll probably be dead in a few days. But he said, if you won't go, I'll have him take my body back to India. And I'll lie there in the Ganges and die in the Ganges to show these people there's one Scotsman that loves them up to die for them. And then he got the response. Then he got the response. But that old book says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that book doesn't say, God so loved Pensacola. Or God so loved the Scambia County. Or God so loved Florida, that book says God so loved the world. J.B. Williams had a conference here with us recently, and some of you heard him speak, and I know you never forget many of his illustrations. The thing he said that impressed me most was he said he heard about an Ethiopian woman in Ethiopia who sold herself in slavery to get enough money to set up a mission station. I thought to myself, my, 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 my. Isn't that something? You think of somebody selling themselves. Well, slavery like an Ethiopian, kind of a household servant, but even then, giving your whole life away to a master for money just to get the gospel to your own people, that's going some. That's going some. I always have a horror, you know, that I'll get to the judgment and find I put more money into dog food than I put into missions. I always have a horror of that. I, I always hope when the books are open I haven't spent more money on a dog or an automobile than I spent trying to get the word out. I picked up a poem one time, I don't know who uh, wrote the thing, and I, I'm sure it's fiction, but it illustrates what I'm trying to say very well. And this is supposedly the, the writing of an Indian who came down into Colorado and saw the white man set up and went back up into the reservation. And the writing goes as follows. I came to you over a trail of many moons from the setting sun. You were the friend of my fathers who have all gone the long way. 
I came with one eye partly open for more light for my people to sit in darkness. I go back with both eyes closed. How can I go back blind to my blind people? I made my way to you with strong arms through many enemies and strange lands that I might carry much back to them. I go back with both arms broken and empty. The two fathers who came with me, the braves of many winters and wars, we leave asleep here by your great water. They were tired in many moons and their moccasins wore out. My people sent me to get the white man's book of heaven. You took me where you allow your women to dance, as we do not ours. And the book was not there. You took me where they worshiped the great spirit with candles, but the book was not there. I saw images and pictures of the good spirits, but the book, but the book, but the book was not among them. I am going back the long, sad trail to my people of the dark land when I tell my poor blind people after one more snow in the council that I did not bring the book, the book, the book. No word will be spoken by our old men and our young braves. One by one they will rise and go out in silence. My people will die in darkness and they will go on the long path to other hunting grounds. No white man will go with them and no white man's book to make the way plain. I have no more words. Now, whether that was ever written or not, but whether anybody wrote that or not, I'll tell you, that shows it just as clear as anything you'll ever see. And there may be a time when Africa will have to start sending missionaries over here. I don't know. That old Indian says, I went to these places, and you took me to places where your women dance. They don't let the women dance in Indian tribes. They sit. They don't dance. They don't dance. Get up and run around the fire half naked with paint all over them. They don't do it. And he said, you took me to this place where the candles were. You get this place where the candles were in the stained glass windows, no book, no book, just candles, stained glass windows, communion table, golden images, silver images, no book, no book, darkness, darkness. Bible said, thy word is a light to my path and a light to my feet. There it is. That's the book of books. Have you done anything to get it to the heathen? The text I read in First Chronicles 16 said, declare his glory among the heathen. Have you done it? I get word sometime about how good we're doing. Now we get tapes out to missionaries overseas. We got tapes right now going out in the African jungle, playing. I don't think we got any in Red China. We got some books getting circulated. One fellow found one of our books in a bookstore in India. I got a letter from a guy who was, he was over there in, in, in Bombay, India, and found the Bible Babel sitting there on the counter, getting a copy. So we get out a little bit, but we don't do one-third what we ought to do. One-fifth what we ought to do. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed all we got is 19 missionaries in the field. I'd like to see uh, 40, 50, 60 families. I'd like to see a thing like, you know, I've always, I've always, uh, if, if, if we had to have a church someday like any church up and down this country, I, I'd, I'd rather have a church, I guess, like J. Oswald Smith, not anybody's. He got 120 missionary families in the field. 120 of them. See? Now, that's a ministry, brethren. That's a ministry. And maybe the Lord has put his hand on some of you to go. I've talked to you about before. There are probably young men and young women in this building right now that ought to be preparing for the mission field. Now, some of you answered the call, and some of you started. Some of you start, and the Lord's going to stop you before you get there. Some of you are willing, but you never started. Now, I'm not worried about those. But probably here there's some man or some woman, some young man or some young woman, and you're not willing. And that's what I'm concerned about. You know something? There'll be something going wrong with your Christian life from now to the day you hit the grave if God has called you and you're not willing. Because the Lord is interested in those people and he loves those people and he wants to reach those people and maybe you're the one to do it. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we're sorry this morning. We can't see things exactly like you see. And I know that many people in my congregation are so filled with pictures. And they've seen so much, so much horror and so much terror that's fake and unreal. The things I've been talking about this morning that are real seem like a dream to them. And like another world. But Lord, we know these things are so. The whole world, life, wickedness, your Bible says. And Father, we pray in Jesus' name you'll bless us here and help us never to forget these people. May we never be so taken up with ourselves we forget these hundreds of thousands of dying people, lost, sick, spiritually, sick, socially.